All right. Welcome everyone to Designing with Docs, Slides, and Sheets. This is an updated version for 2023. So if you come to this session in the past, I've held it for the past two digital district days. I've You'll see some stuff looks similar and I've got some new stuff. I'm pretty excited about the new stuff. So Allison is my moderator. She's putting stuff into the chat. You can grab the link to the deck as well as the link to the warm opener in there. And we're gonna go ahead and get going. All right, let's start with that warm opener. So I've got a warm opener uh, and I would like you to go ahead and fill that out real quick. Shouldn't take more than a minute or so. Um, and so go ahead and uh, Allison's putting in the chat over and over again, grab it, fill out that warm opener. I wanna know a little bit about you. All right, let's go see what's on our warm open over here. Okay, so um, we've got some some different job titles in here. Uh, we've got people who um, teach elementary school, classroom teacher, classroom teacher, librarians, principals, paraeducators. There we go. Uh, family liaisons, art teachers. I'm seeing S10 paras. I'm seeing combo classroom teachers, um, SDC staff. I'm seeing assessment clerks, I'm seeing all sorts of people in here. That's really great. I'm really excited. Uh, substitutes, district nurses. Uh, we've got desktop support, de de department of technology in the house. I love it. Um, lots and lots of people, lots and lots of different types of people here. El um, instrumental teachers, instrumental music teachers. That's awesome. So then I was curious, what do you do? Because, right, because like I can say that I have this job title or I am this thing, but like, what does that mean to you? And what do you do? And so um, I asked that question and I've got, you know, we teach um, para for special needs, teach students, teach a combo class. Oh, what was that one? Um, I inspire students to express themselves as artists, teaching students to be ready for the future. These are great. Um, building young minds, teaching in a classroom, um, facilitating experiences for students to learn, managing the landscapes at the district. Wow, we got a whole bunch of different kinds of people in here. I love it. So many different um, different jobs and roles and things that make things go. Um, helping families learn how to support their students, supporting students that um, that have IEPs, helping students achieve goals, librarians, reading, literacy, all sorts of things. That's really wonderful. Thank you for thank you for sharing. Uh, I also asked you. Um, I was curious if my, so every year, this is, I should back up. This is the third year I've done this session. And every year I ask this question and I was curious, I was like, maybe this year the answer will finally be different. Uh, spoiler alert, it is not. Uh, what your, the favorite tool every single year is always slides. Every time I run this, it's always slides. Um, and I think part of that, my, this is, a, this is a educated guess. I think that part of that probably comes from, we're just like used to slides and we're familiar with slides and you can do a lot of fun stuff in slides. Um, I do have some people who I've got a third here who are like docs, docs is where it's at. Um, and docs can be surprisingly beautiful. That's, that's something that we're going to work on today is making docs surprisingly beautiful. So if docs aren't your favorite, that's okay. I think you'll learn some new things about docs. And then my 10% here, my sheets people, I would say that sheets actually is my favorite one. Uh, and I think it can be strange because when we think of sheets, that's a spreadsheet tool and, you know, what can you do in a spreadsheet tool besides data? You can do a lot. You can do a lot of stuff in a spreadsheet tool. And we are going to look at that today. Um, so uh, to my high five to all my sheets people out here who are sheets is your favorite. So I asked you what your favorite was. And then I was like, well, now I'm curious, what is your least favorite? And let's see. Oh, yes. Overwhelmingly sheets. Everyone's like, no to sheets. No to sheets. Um, I would. I hope to change some hearts and some minds today. Sheets is... Sheets is just a giant table. That's all it is. Um, you can put numbers in it or you can put other things in it. So we're gonna talk about sheets today. And I, I hope you walk away. It may not be your favorite and that's okay, but it maybe it won't be your least favorite anymore. Um, and then I was just curious kind of where we sit on the on the, the spectrum of experience and comfort with Google tools. And um, I asked all the way from like level one, I'm I'm brand new, I, I, I don't feel comfortable. I don't know a lot. I haven't used it a lot yet. All up to seven, I'm an expert. Um, and so I, this is pretty standard for this session. I usually see a lot of fours and fives. That's great. If you are a four and a five, this is exactly where you should be. If you are a one, two, or even three, this session might be a little bit over 
uh, th this is this is more of like an intermediate session. It's not necessarily a beginner session, but you can stay. Uh, if you have a can-do attitude and you've got a growth mindset, you can absolutely stay and you will learn things today. It's okay if you've, if you've never touched docs in your life, you will learn things today, it'll be fine. So if you are on the lower end of the spectrum, you don't have to leave, you are welcome to stay. Just be aware that this is a little bit of a, we're at an intermediate level here for this. Um, and then my, my advanced people over here on this end, uh, I think you're gonna learn something new today too. I'm, I'm, I feel confident. I'm gonna boldly, confidently say you're gonna learn something too. Everybody will learn something today. So I'm gonna go back to my deck. Thank you for filling out that warm opener. Okay, I'm gonna introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who know me or have seen me, seen my sessions before, this slide is a little different. I took a new job. Uh, it's still in the, dis in the district, but I'm moving to the libraries team. Um, and it's, 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 it's like a week. I've worked on the libraries team for a week. Uh, so I'm really excited to get to be in a kind of a, a different place and learn some new things, but it's also bittersweet because it's hard to leave the people and the work that I've been so dedicated to um, so far. If you don't know me, I was previously um, the district's primary Google trainer. Uh, I did that job for four years. It was very rewarding um, and very exciting and interesting, but you know, sometimes you're just ready for something new. So I'm, um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's that bittersweet. I'm excited for new things, but I'm also going to miss a lot of the stuff I was working on before. Um, but yeah, I'm Jessica Peterson. I have a moderator, uh, Allison. Allison, you want to unmute and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, I have previously worked in Department of Technology and worked very closely and collaborated with Jessica. And so this is like my super fun time when I get to moderate with her so I can learn at the same time as like help and be back up for her. Now I work in the superintendent's department. Yeah, so Allison is my moderator. I'm very lucky to have her. Uh, this year I, I messaged her and I was like, hey, do you have plans on Digital District Day? Will you moderate for me? Because she is, she's the best in my opinion. So uh, that brings us to a couple of housekeeping things. The first one is the sign in link. If you have not yet signed in, sign in. If you have already signed in, you're good. You can ignore this. That's that's not a task for you. You've done it. Check. You only have to sign in once. And Allison has put the sign in link into the chat. Here's some information about how to get paid for Digital District Day. If you are a teacher, para, or sub, you can be paid for your time today. Uh, I'm not going to go over this because this is this information has been available in a lot of other places, but just know that you can get paid. You can find information on the website, sfusd.edu slash ddd. And Allison also put this into the chat. Okay, let's talk about our agenda. Um, I We are going to finish at 2.45 today. And so... Uh, because the next micro, the first micro session, micro session one starts at 2.45, I think, or maybe it starts at 2.50. Either way, we're gonna stop at 2.45. I don't have a micro session to lead. So I will say this, that like, this is my plan, but at the very end, I'm happy to stay and keep going. If people have questions, if, if um, people have things they wanna see or whatever, we can absolutely keep going. Um, but this is kind of our agenda for we're gonna try to fit into, into our time. So we've got some opening moves. We've actually mostly finished those. We're going to talk about what makes design good. Um, I think that uh, a lot of times design, especially around graphic design, is kind of like, well, it just like feels right. But there are some actual principles. I'm going to give you some like tips and strategies and things to think about, resources, all that kind of stuff, specifically around design. And then within that, we're going to talk about designing for accessibility. We're going to move into Google Docs. I've got some tips, tricks, and examples. And then I've got a challenge for you. Um, and so I'm excited to see if you can if you can be successful with my challenge. We'll do the same thing for sheets, tips, tricks, examples, and then I've got a challenge, and then slides, same things, tips, tricks, examples, challenge time. Um, if we if we have time, uh, we started a little late, but if we have time, we will uh, we will do some closing moves. So let's go. Here we go. There's we did the warm up partner already. Great. Uh, these are our norms for today. Some uh, The very first one is to type the questions into the chat. Several of you are already doing a really great job at typing questions into the chat. Thank you so much. The chat is Allison's domain. That's what she is focused on today. That is the thing that she, that's her like sole uh, uh, thing that she is looking at. And so when, if you have a question as it comes up, put it in the chat um, and she will, she will answer it. She knows, I, I would say at least 95% of what I know. I might know like a tiny bit more than her, but she knows almost everything there's to know about Google tools. So she's gonna be able to answer most of your questions. If you do stump her, which is rare, but if you do stump her, um, she's gonna 
interrupt me and ask me the question and I will I will answer it for the group. Same thing if she sees a question or she's seen a question multiple times, she thinks the whole group would benefit from hearing from, she's gonna go ahead and interrupt me and ask that question. Uh, so please go ahead and put all your questions into the chat. The second norm actually doesn't really apply today because this is a webinar. So you may have noticed that there is no video and no microphone for you. Um, I cannot I cannot see you or hear you, but it's I'm very grateful you are here. Uh, so that actually that one doesn't matter so much. We can skip that norm. The last norm though is, is the most important norm. And if you've been with me before, this is, I always have this norm. It's my favorite one. I think it's the most important. And that is to take what you can today and come back for more later. Um, with any new skill with any tool, with anything you're working on there, even if it's like really easy to kind of get started, there's usually like a pretty deep part to it, right? And design, first of all, design is a deep thing. It takes time, it takes practice. It takes um, making a bunch of bad stuff before you realize what is good stuff. It also, when it comes to doc slides and sheets, they are tools that are easy to get started on, but they can be really complex when you're ready for them to be. And so I really want you to you're going to get a lot of information today. You've got the deck, you've got resources. There's lots of ways to find this information later. You know, take what you can today, absorb two or three things, and then the rest you can always get later. There's lots of time to get that information later. This is the time of year when you get more information than any other time in the year. And so it's, it's okay to only get, you know, two things out of this time. That's totally fine. Two, two is enough. Honestly, one is enough. You get one out. We are, we are, it's successful. So Let's do it. We're going to jump right into um, the goal of design. The goal of user-centered design is to minimize cognitive load on the user. And you'll notice that I said the goal of user-centered design. There are design projects that are more like artwork, right? Where it's not necessarily, you're not meant to like be able to read all the letters of the words, right? That's, that's different. That's a different art area of design. We're talking about user-centered design. The goal of user-centered design is to minimize cognitive load on the user because any energy they spend navigating or using your document takes away the energy they have for that information or whatever you're asking them to do. So for example, if you've made um, an assignment for students to complete or a form for employees to fill out, um, something like that, and people are spending a long time and a lot of energy trying to understand how to fill out the form, it makes it a lot harder to fill out the form, right? It makes, um, if they're spending a lot of time trying to navigate it or trying to understand what they're supposed to write where, that's wasted energy. So the goal of user-centered design is to minimize that cognitive load. And we do that through two things. They're like steps here. You want everything to be consistent. So you wanna use the same colors, the same fonts, the same formatting all the way through. And you want things to be intuitive. You want it to be structured and organized to make navigation really easy. And if you do both of those steps, then you're ready to be user-centered. And that means that it's comprehensible and it's accessible. So we're looking for consistency, intuitiveness, and um, that's how you end up at user-centered design. Uh, there are, if you ask, if you ask like a professional graphic designer, how many principles of graphic design are there? They will tell you all, all different numbers. Um, I've seen articles that are like 20 principles, three principles, like you'll, any number you want is that there's that many principles of graphic design. I've chosen six that I think are the most relevant. And so I'm going to talk about each of those six. So we've got typography, which is a fancy word for fonts. We've got color. We're going to talk about balance, hierarchy repetition and alignment. Um, so these are the six that we're gonna focus on. And you'll notice that on this slide, on slide 11, they're all linked. So actually, if you click on that one, it will take you to the slide that's about it. So I, it's, it's, it's intuitive design right there. See, modeling what I'm teaching. So let's start with typography. Typography, like I said, is just a fancy word for fonts. If you wanna sound like really, you know, professional and uh, like you really know what you're talking about, just throw like typography into, into a sentence. You know, I really think we should consider the typography here of this resource, um, but it just means the fonts. That's all it means. And there are many different families of fonts. The four main ones you see, uh, well, I guess the four main ones that are kind of like the, the basics, there are lots of other families, but the four basics um, is serif fonts and serif fonts have little feet on them. So I've got some examples here. We've got Georgia, Times and Roman and Laura. They tend to look kind of old fashioned or traditional. Those are serif fonts. There's like little feet on all of the, all the letters. Like a T is a good example. There's like those feet at the bottom. Sans serif fonts have no serifs. Sans actually means without 
Um, and so these are fonts without serifs, no serifs. So like we've got Montserrat, Calibri, and Verdana. I never know how if I'm pronouncing these font names right. Um, these, these three are, um, they don't have any serifs. There's no little feet on anything. Uh, another family is the slab serifs. And these are kind of like in the middle between, it's like if like there's a Venn diagram, you've got serif, you got sans serif, like where it overlaps, that's your slab serif. Um, they're usually like thicker, thicker letters, but they're like uniformly thick. So like, um, like in Arvo, you can see that like all of the, the lines are like the same thickness. Um, and then they oftentimes do have serifs on them. Um, but you can see the serifs aren't, they don't look so much, they, they aren't like curved the way they are in serif fonts. They're like bricks, like at the bottom. Um, so uh, slab serif fonts are, uh, are kind of like uh, the, that middle of the Venn diagram between the two. And then script fonts are really common and they just look like handwriting. If it looks like handwriting, it's a script font. Uh, when you're choosing fonts, pick two. You get two, only two, not three, not four, just two, pick two. Pick one for titles. That one's usually bigger, so it can be more creative. You might do a script font for a title. Um, you might do like kind of like a funky fun font. Um, titles, since it's usually bigger, that can be a more creative font. For text, you want to choose something easy to read. And um, sans serif fonts are generally easier to read. Um, and I can see that uh, Julia put in the chat that sans serif fonts are easier to read um, for folks with dyslexia as well. So generally, no matter whether, whether you have um, like a visual processing um, accommodation you need or not, sans serif fonts in general for humans are easier to read on screens um, and even, even more so for people with dyslexia or other um, processing disabilities. When, you, when you've got your two fonts, the other thing to consider is font size and the formatting. The size should just be big enough so it can, it's easy to read, but it doesn't take up too much space. So like size, you know, 50 font is easy to read, but it's also too big, right? It's like that, almost like the, the three bears, like too big, too small, just right, same idea. Um, and sometimes that takes a little bit of playing with. And sometimes it means like turning and asking your friend, like, is this readable? Um, so, but it's, it's kind of that nice like balancing act. And then sometimes we bold a lot of things because we're like the whole paragraph is important. No, if you're going to use bold, bold is for emphasis. So only bold the parts you want to emphasize, maybe like vocabulary words or like a single sentence that you want to stick out. That's what bold is for. And so I've got an example here. Oh, no, sorry. I'm just kidding. I've got resources. That's what's here. Um, these are, some of these are, um, uh, these, these top three things here are articles. Like if you're like, ooh, fonts are really exciting and intriguing. I want to learn more. Those are articles and things you can read about fonts along with like um, this, this is 12 fonts they recommend. They're easy to read, all sorts of things. You can find fonts in Google fonts and Google fonts has hundreds. It might even be thousands of fonts by now. It's a lot of fonts. If you want a font, it's um, you can find something in Google fonts. The other fonts that we um, often recommend are Lexend and Lexend Deca. And those are two fonts that were actually very specifically designed by researchers for readability. They did studies, they adjusted the letters and the shapes and the spacing, and all that stuff. And Lexend and Lexend Deca, people, people in the in the research uncomprehended under comprehended, that's a word, yeah, comprehended more than in other fonts. Um, they are Google fonts. You can find them in um in docs, in slides, in sheets, in I think they're even in forms now. You can find them in all the Google tools. Um, and I've got a link here if you're curious, like how did they design a font? You can actually learn more about how Lexend was designed here. So that's typography. Let's talk color. Um, color, remember that we're striving for consistency and intuitiveness, right? Those are the two things we want. Color, the big thing is consistency. Um, you wanna be really purposeful. Color does give a mood. Uh, so you want to think about how do you want this file, this document, this deck, whatever it is to make people feel. Um, you can also use color really carefully to color code. And if you can repeat the same patterns over and over again um, with color, you can establish it. It makes it easier for the brain to understand. So for example, in this deck, you might notice that like the title here is orange. So that makes that stick out a little bit. Um, and if I'm going I'm to go back a slide for a second, you'll see that here the title is also orange. So I'm, I'm forming a pattern using color. Oh. Um, and then contrast, I alluded to that a little bit already. That's how you can make things stick out. So in this case, my orange title sticks out a little more than the rest of the slide. Um, and you can make things pop using color really strategically. To do that, you want to choose a color palette and stick with it. That's that consistency piece. So we're looking for four to six colors. 
Okay, that's that's a good rule of thumb. Sometimes you need seven or eight, depending upon your project. Sometimes it's a little more, um, but in general, four to six colors is a good number of colors to include. That means one base color plus white. So like a lot of times like a base color would be black or dark gray in the SFUSD context here in this one, navy is our base color. Um, so you want like some sort of like neutral dark base color and then white, and then two to four colors as accents. So in SFUSD, um, we use that orange as an accent. We use the light blue as an accent. Um, and then there's actually like a dark maroony red that you, you don't see very often. I think it's kind of an ugly color. That dark maroony red is also considered an accent color. When you're doing colors in Google, Google uses hex codes um, for colors. So there's different ways you can format a color, like you could, like a in order to identify a color. There's different ways you can identify a color. RGB values is one, hex codes is another, and Google uses hex codes. And then um, standard color schemes can be really helpful sometimes. So for example, in SFUSD, when I present to SFUSD people, I use SFUSD decks, and then I can reuse my slides. I can interchange them really easily between decks because they all use the same templates and the same colors and the same fonts and all that kind of stuff. So you want to, um, like coming up with like a standard color scheme can be really useful sometimes, but it also can be fun to do something different. So there are different kinds of, um, of color groupings. And so when you come up with a color palette, there's different ways you can choose colors. Uh, it just kind of depends on how, on how you want to do it. So just kind of, an, just to show an example that like these are different possible color palettes that you could have and they just they have special design names and then I've got some resources here for you uh, a lot of times to find color palettes when I'm not doing like an SFUSD document to find a color palette I will just do a google search for color palette hex codes or like purple palette hex codes or like you know I'll, I'll just search for that and so that way it sh it'll show me lots of different color palettes and usually the hex codes will be part of the image so I don't have to look them up which is really nice Coolers is um, a random palette generator that can be a lot of fun to kind of play with and like cycle through random palettes. I really, um, I really enjoy coolers. A tint and shade generator is a great tool to have because sometimes you've got, you know, like your core four colors and you're like, oh, I just need this one color to be a little bit darker here. Um, tint and shade generator can either make a color lighter or darker and help you um, choose which one's the right one for your situation. And then a color blender will find the color in the middle between two colors. Um, so like if you got, you know, like red and blue, it'll find purple, you know, it's, 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 uh, but it's like more nuanced than that. It's like, it's very scientific how it does it. So those are some resources for color. Balance is our third principle that we're going to talk about today in graphic design. And balance is where things are equally distributed. So actually, like, if you look at this slide right now, this slide is not currently balanced, right? It's very heavy on the left side. This is not balanced. There's actually an image that's gonna be in this white space. I just didn't wanna distract you with it. So something is gonna come for that space. But like right now you can see that it's, it, it, isn't, it isn't even visually. Um, the more that an element attracts the eye, the greater its visual weight. So that's why the text feels heavier is because that's, that's something that's attracting your eye whereas like the white space isn't grabbing your eye as much. And so that feels lighter. There are some there are some rules of visual weight influencers. Um, if something is larger, it feels heavier. If something is darker, it feels heavier. Uh, if it's got a higher contrast, it feels heavier. So, like if there's more, um, if it sticks, basically it sticks out more. Multiple small objects can balance a large one. So if I got like three smaller dots and one big dot, those balance out. Uh, more complex shapes are heavier than simple ones. So like just a triangle is a lot lighter than, um, you know, like a starburst type shape that's heavier. Vertical lines are heavier than horizontal lines and diagonal lines are the heaviest. So if you've got like, and it, it doesn't have to necessarily be a line, but if you've got like, you know, four pictures in a row, um, if their four pictures are vertical, they weigh more than if the four pictures are horizontal. And if the four pictures are diagonal, then they weigh the most. And so weight again, where, where something is heavier, that's where it's gonna pull your eye. So um, you wanna really choose these things carefully so that you're picking where people are looking first. You wanna guide their eye. Brighter, more intense color is heavier and warm colors tend to be heavier than cool colors. So like the red, orange, those ones tend to be the heaviest. And then, you know, the greens, blues, purples tend to be the lightest, but um, in actual, as far as like actual colors, red is the heaviest color and yellow is the lightest color. 
Um, I've got a, I've got a, a resource linked here that you can, if, if you're like, whoa, balance is fascinating. Why do larger things attract our eye over smaller things? You can learn more about it here. Um, but basically you want to use balance. You want things to be evenly distributed um, and then use it at times to draw the eye in certain ways so that they look at things in a certain order. So this is an example of uh, um, balance here. Um, and here's some, um, both of these are balanced. Um, there's just different kinds of balance. So we've got symmetrical balance where it feels like very even all the way down, top to bottom, it all feels very even. And then you've also got asymmetrical balance. This is balanced, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like perfect cookie cutter. Everything is the same type. Um, both of these are balanced. Okay. Hierarchy and repetition actually put together on the same slide. So I have them as two separate principles on that slide of six. I put them together because they're they're related a lot of times. Um, hierarchy is how you signal importance. And so you can think about like in a hierarchical uh, organization, the person at the top is, you know, the most important, right? That sort of thing. Um, the person at the top might have like the most attention on them, um, that sort of th same idea. So with hierarchy in when you're designing documents, you want to use contrast, color, and size as a way to signal which thing is the most important. You want to guide users' eyes. So large objects attract the eye before small ones. Isolated objects, objects off by themselves somewhere, attract the eye before groupings. So if you've got like a single thing by itself and you've got a group of things, people will look at the single thing first. And then high contrast attracts the eye over low contrast. So you've got like, you know, like a bright orange um, square that's going to attract the eye over, you know, like a gray square. Right. Um, and then you can kind of use those then with in pair with repetition that if you're using the same format over and over again, you're drawing people's eyes in the same way that provides that consistency and that intuitiveness, the more comfortable they feel navigating through your thing, the more intuitive it is. And so those, that intuitiveness comes from patterns. A lot of times brains like predictability. We like patterns. It makes us feel calm. It like makes us feel like we know what we can expect. Um, and similar objects are grouped together by the brain. So icons and images can help establish patterns. And so here's an example of um, a design. And so this uses both hierarchy and repetition to help us navigate this page. We've got the title at the top. That's the most important thing. It's the biggest. It's right in the front. It's got, you know, it really stands out. Um, the little tiny text underneath, less important. So that's why it's smaller and tucked away. And then the pictures of the food are like the next biggest thing, right? So those like the, those, those are high contrast. They're catching your eye, but they're also repetitive. It's a circle every single time. It's a circle that's like inside of a box with a, like it's, it's using that repetition as well as that hierarchy um, to guide your eyes as to what's important and what they want you to focus on. Okay. I think this is, I think this is the, is this the last one? I've lost count if this is number five or number uh, number six, but alignment, I think it's number six. Alignment is um, really just about using grid layouts. And so you want to line up elements to create order because order feels good. It's that predictability. Our brains are like, oh, okay, yeah, that all fits together. That makes sense. It, it, it helps combine things. Um, it also improves readability and comprehensibility. So when you're, when you're lining things up, it makes it easier again for the brain to navigate. And then you can also, along with alignment, all of these are really interrelated, but balance and hierarchy are also important parts of your grid so that you wanna merge spaces to make bigger things more important. Um, and you can create variety and draw the eye in different places in that way. There are built-in tools to remove the guesswork. Um, it's really hard to like evenly line up two things, um, you know, perfectly by themselves, but uh, all the Google tools have smart guides. They all have alignment tools and distribution tools to help you, um, you know, make things like all aligned centrally together or distributed evenly and in a space. Those are all built-in tools. So here's an example actually using the New York Times. New York Times uses a grid layout. And so you can see that um, it's basically it's basically five columns across. And the top one is merged. That's the big title space. We've got this first left column is just one single column. Here in the middle, these are all two columns that are merged together to make a, a space together. And that picture is nice and big. It grabs your attention. Then over here, we've got a little bit of a split. But at the top here, they're each, you know, um, each one using one column, but then down here at the bottom, they're merged again. Uh, and so this is an example of making different size spaces to think about hierarchy and to think about um, balance as well. Okay, images and icons. Um, 
images and icons I mentioned can really help with predictability, with intuitiveness, um, with establishing patterns and all that kind of stuff. But if you use images and icons, they have to respect copyright and attribution requirements. It is legally required. It's also really important to model for students. Uh, that idea of even in you know a world of influencers that like if you take someone's thing and remix it or take someone's you know song and use it you should give them credit for it. Same idea with pictures. So um, I've got an example here. This is actually something I made. And you can see that the, the peanut butter and jelly picture, I didn't take it, so I've cited it underneath. Um, I've also got some icons here to kind of help with like a pattern, a visual pattern of knowing what each thing that's asking you to do. And these are my favorite image and um, picture resources. Unsplash is great. It does require attribution, but they tell you, you copy and paste the thing that they want you to to put in. So um, Unsplash makes it really easy to attribute. Only GFX is great for, um, I use it for like watercolor um, backgrounds and borders and that kind of stuff. Um, actually, there's a monster image later that you see that comes from Only GFX. It does not require any attribution. It is um, free to use, open, um, open, open source. I'm not sure what the word is there. Um, it's no attribution required. Material icons is um, are icons that are made by Google. And so I find a lot of like really common icons in there, like export or share or um, some of those like icons you might see in applications. Google has like made a library of them, um, but there's lots of like, there's like a globe in there and there's other ones in there. So the uh, material icons is great, no attribution required. And then the noun project is also great for icons, but it does require attribution. If you buy a license, you don't have to attribute, um, but I, I, I think it's good again to model attribution for students that we're giving credit to people who did other work that we're using to make our work easier. And so um, I, you definitely don't have to pay for a license. I think it's just as just as you know appropriate to say that you know this icon came from this person in your document. Okay, there was a question in the chat a little bit ago about um, checking for color. Uh, we were talking about color, and they're like, you know, checking for contrast with color to make sure that it's accessible. That is here. So um, Margo asked about that. That's here. There's a few things to consider when you're cons when you're designing for accessibility um, specifically. Uh, and accessibility here, what I'm referring to is people with um, who have special accommodations or who need um, maybe assistive tools to help them navigate uh, a, a space, a document, a place of um, where they're learning stuff. And so the three things I would like you to keep in mind, these are, there's lots of things in accessibility. These are the three that I think are the most important personally, um, is meaningful links. This is something that helps everyone. People, when we look at a web page, we skim the page for the links. And so if every link says click here, or it says this form, that doesn't tell you anything about what that link is for. And so I've got some examples here that instead of it saying like, click here to learn more about this thing, I just linked the thing as the thing you click. So when you're skimming this page, you know, your, your eye is caught to those links because they stand out because of contrasting color. And um, those things help you kind of understand what that link is for. Screen readers also, um, one way that screen readers can navigate a page is by reading out the links. And so um, if it all just says, click here, click here, click here, click here, that's not useful to anyone. Headings are another one. These both create visible structure and they also create an outline. Within Google Docs, headings in particular, um, use a, there's a lot of features that auto-populate if you make something a heading. Uh, the table of contents, headings are links. You can link directly to a heading. So like if you have like a section in your Google Doc about how to do something, you can actually link directly to that section. Um, and then there's now in pageless mode, Google Docs now has a pageless mode. Um, and that's, there's, if you have heading links, you can actually collapse your sections. If you were in my Google Docs session earlier today, we took a look at that. If you missed it, watch the recording, but um, collapsible sections in Pages mode are really great. And then also as far as like um, people with accommodations and with, with um, tools that help them, screen readers use headings to navigate. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like using a table of contents for the page instead of just reading the whole page, right? We do that too. When we, when we skim through a page, we look at what the headings are, decide if we want to read that section, screen readers do the same thing. Um, contrasting colors. So some color combinations are easier to read than others. Um, you know, white on this navy blue is, is a high contrast thing. It's easier to read than if, you know, if I did like white on top of yellow, that would be very hard to read. Uh, you can use a contrast checker. It's linked here. AA is good. AAA. So double A is good. Triple A is better. And I've got some examples here using um, SFUSD colors that like that navy blue on top of white 
passes both. It's 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 both good and it's better. Um, but the other ones, like this one, the light blue on top of the navy blue is good, but it's not the AAA. Um, these two at the top, the white with the light blue, which are probably really hard to read, um, do not pass either AA or, or AAA, AA or AAA, they don't pass either. So um, this is a, it's just something to kind of think about that like you, you may have looked at like student work where they like make everything neon pink and you're like, I can't read it. That's because of contrast. So um, it's good when you're designing stuff, whether you're designing stuff for students, for families, for staff members in the district, for your, um, if you have people that you supervise, if you're, if you're designing stuff for them, consider contrast to make it easier to read. That's, that's a, that's a, um, a, a thing that you want to do to make sure that it's really uh, comprehensible for them. Like I said, that um, accessibility, there's lots of pieces of accessibility. So I have other links here to other accessibility things. If you're um, really interested in, in accessible design, there's lots of resources here. I feel free to check those out. Um, and in the end, accessibility practices help all people. Um, yeah, maybe I can read the neon green on top of the dark purple thing, but it's a lot easier for my eyes to read the, you know, the the black on top of the white. Or, you know, it's it's like, Yes, even if some people can do it, it's nicer if it's easier for everyone. And so accessibility practices really, they help everybody. Okay, I'm gonna give you like a one minute, cause I talked a lot, like a one minute really quick, um, like stretch, move around, shake something out. I'm gonna take a drink and um, maybe like, you know, stretch some joints. All right. Ooh. Here we go. Google Docs. Um, Google Docs is a word processing tool. And we're going to talk about the strengths, like when you would use Google Docs. I've got some strategies and tips. And then I've got a challenge for you. Okay. So the strengths of Docs is that Docs are great for text. That's what they were built for. Um, word processing was meant for text. They are typically easy to print um, because they're the default is that they come in like paper sized pages and it's really easy to scroll between multiple pages. If you if you type so much that it fills up a page, it automatically goes to the next one. So that's like a really nice piece if you're gonna be typing a lot of text. You can also within docs, Google docs specifically, you can link to headings within the same doc. You, there's a built-in table of contents feature. There's lots of things inside Google docs that aren't in, that are, like, are natively built in that aren't part of other Google tools. And so if you're looking for, yeah, linking to headings or table of contents that do it automatically for you, docs is your, docs is your tool. I've got some examples here and I'm going to open up one here. Um, oh, that's not the one I wanted. I lied. I'm not gonna open that one. I'm gonna open up this one. This is the one I wanted. Um, this is, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. It's about to 75. Okay. This is a flyer. Um, this flyer is a uh is made in Google Docs. I, I promise you can see here's the Google Docs thing. It is made in Google Docs. Um and so Google Docs really can be surprisingly beautiful. There's a lot of um a lot of things you can do inside of Google Docs. And what the secret is to this Google Doc is that it's a table. There's a table, an invisible table holding this whole thing up. That's what's happening inside this Google Doc. Um, and so the um, you don't have to, I think a lot of times when we see docs, we have you know just like a lot of text over and over and over and over and over again, right? Um, and that is not the case. It doesn't have to be that way. You can put pictures in Google Docs. You can create borders. I've got, you know, here's that watercolor stuff that I was talking about. Um, Google Docs can be really beautiful. Um, this, I am also gonna show you my resume. This is this is my resume. This is what my resume looks like. I'm gonna zoom back out here a little bit so you can see it. Um, so again, this is built inside of a Google doc and what's holding it up is an invisible table. That's, that's what it is. Um, so I think a lot of people, like I said, feel like docs is boring. You can't do a lot with it. It's just text. It's hard, doc, docs is hard with pictures sometimes because like the text acts funny around the picture. Um, but you can actually make really beautiful things inside Google Docs if you just have a couple tools in your tool belt. It's 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 um it's easier than it looks. So the way that I um the way that I built these things in Google Docs is I created structure. And what I did, how to create structure, like I said, it's an invisible table. This invisible table is what's holding it up. So here I'm going to show you that newsletter again, but this time with the table visible. I wish it would. Okay, so this is actually the table that's holding the whole thing up. You can see I've merged some spaces together. I've got this long skinny one for this picture. 
but this is actually how, this is what's holding up this document. And then what I did is I went and I made all of those lines that are black. I went and I made them invisible. I made them transparent. And so they've got, um, so you couldn't see those, but that's that's what's putting everything in place and keeping things aligned nicely and neatly. Um, you can see there's a lot of balance here. I've got, you know, one big one and then I've got two small ones and those balance out the two. Um, there's a lot of a lot of pieces in here that help make this look as nice as it does. Um, so like I said, borderlines can be visible or they can be hidden. Uh, I make a lot of things in docs where the table is hidden entirely. Uh, when you wanna hide it, you just set the border width to zero and then it's it's invisible. And you can also merge cells to make different size spaces. So that's my that's my big like number one tip in Google Docs is to is to create structure with a table. In Docs, you can also adjust your working space. You can under page setup, you can change the size of the page. You can also switch it to pageless if you're not going to print it. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the shape or size of a page. Um, and then the you can also customize the margins in there. So I can you can make it you know like have less space around the outside edge. Uh, the default is one inch, but if you're not printing it, you really don't need a one inch border around a one inch margin around your doc. So feel free to play with that, adjust those. You can change, you know, or, uh, landscape instead of portrait, lots of, lots of um, options for page setup in there. And then when you're in page setup, you can also change the background color of the page. So one of my examples was this flyer and I wish it didn't zoom in so big. Let's zoom that out. I'm actually out here. Um, this flyer is actually a single cell table. This is a one by one table. And then I'm, and I made the background of that table cell white. I made the border a yellow polka dot border. And then the page, the background of the page, I made purple. So that's how I ended up with this like nice purple thing around the back edge here. Um, and it's just a one by one table. Okay. So I'm, I've got some people that are asking like, how do you merge the cells? Can you show us an example? Yes, I will show you an example. Uh, some other tips and tricks just to kind of keep in mind is that, oh, see, and I didn't even look at my slide, it's unfinished. Um, you can use headers and footers, um, which is nice because then it's stuff that's like stuck on, if it's, a, if it's in a header or it's in a footer, footer it shows up on every single page. Um, there are no headers or footers in pageless mode because it doesn't show up on every page, there's no page. You can also insert images into Google Docs. Um, they do sometimes act a little weird. And so it's better if you use, if you're using a table for structure, if you give the um, image its own cell. So I'm actually gonna go back and show you here, um, this one, that like this swirly loopy guy, I gave him his own cell, that he is all by himself. Same thing with this dotted thing here in their own cell. So I don't have to um, try to like make it be in the right place, it stays in its box, which is nice. Um, so I do recommend that if you're gonna, if you're using a table for structure and you're putting in images, give them their own cell. That's the easiest way to do it. And then obviously my slides were left unfinished, um, but there's building blocks and drop-down menus now built into docs. My session that I did, um, session number two earlier today, the recording should be posted within a day or so. Um, I think it's within 24 hours it's posted. It might even already be up there. Um, that talks about how to do building blocks and drop-down menus. But basically, Google Docs got a whole upgrade of features, um, and it's it's pretty incredible. I do recommend um, learning about building blocks and drop-down menus. So I've got some resources here. You were asking, like, how do I merge the cells? In this document here, I'm going to open it. This is my um, Designing with Docs, and it's got lots of, sorry, it's kind of weirdly skinny. It's because I'm, uh, I'm zoomed in a little bit. Um, but it's got, you know, how do I create a table? How do I merge cells? Like here's the steps on how to merge, how to merge cells. Um, there it is, merge cells in a table. And it tells you right here how to merge cells. So all of the instructions and how to do things are in here. Um, I've also got um, like a basics. If you're like, I've never touched Google Docs before. I've got like a basics resource for you here. I've got our district docs resources, as well as a link back to that accessibility resources slide if you're curious about that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a challenge. I would like you in Google Docs, go and open up a new tab in Google Docs, create this table, create this, uh, what am I gonna call this, art piece, this picture using a table. Um, I will. I recommend putting your paper, your page into landscape orientation and um, you're gonna have to merge some stuff. You're gonna have to do some fill colors, that kind of stuff. Um, the next slide, 
So this slide, so I'm on slide 26. The next slide, slide 27, has some hints for you to make it a little bit easier. So if you're like, I don't even know where to start, check out those hints. Um, but I'm going to give you 10 minutes, and um, I would like you to see if you can make this, make this picture. Allison, can you put the link to the deck in the chat again so people can get to page to slide 26 and 27? Okay, so there's that link to that deck. Um, slide 26 is where you can, that's the slide we're currently looking at. The next one, slide 27, has um, some hints and some things to make it a little bit easier if that's what you want. But if you want like a real challenge, um, see if you can make this. That's why we, um, Marco put in the chat that um, losing, you know, lost all their skills over the summer. That's This is a good day to brush the dust off, to be like, oh, oh, that's right. If the button is over here, I know how to do this. Um, yeah. Yes, Dan, so, um, if you're if you're like why is everyone quiet right now um you're going to open up a, a new tab and um go ahead and create a new google doc you can actually um type docs.new uh fun fact and that will open up a brand new google doc if you're logged in with your google account um and you're gonna in this in this new document you're going to create uh the table and it's gonna actually look like this i can let's see 50 percent. there we go okay that might, that's what, that's what you're making is this thing here. Um, the slide 27 has hints on it. Um, if honestly, if you get something close, like the colors are different, that's totally fine. Um, the real thing that I want you to focus on is making the table merging and the borders. That's what I'm, that's what I'm really looking for. And it's only been like three minutes of work time. So if you're like, I, <laughs> How will I finish this? It, it, we actually still have a good chunk of time left. So you have um, seven minutes left to keep working on this. I'm noticing that a lot of people are asking questions or making comments and they're just sending it to Jessica and myself. If you look in the chat feature, the blue, where you see hosts and panelists, try to select everyone. And that way we can, people could be like, oh yes, I have that question as well. And we could respond to the whole group with the answer.
Okay. It's been about four and a half minutes of work time. Um, I'm going to let you work for, I'm going to let you try it on your own for another minute or so. And then I'm going to start kind of demonstrating how to do it. So if you feel that you're like, I don't have any idea, feel free to look at some resources for another minute or so. And then I will, I will show how I, how this is made. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how um, how I made this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a new new tab, that's that new, new document. Um, if you are still working on it, feel free to like focus on your thing and keep working on it, that's totally fine. So you'll see here in my toolbar, I don't see a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of things here. Um, if I click this snow person menu, that's where all my buttons are. It's because my screen is, is skinny and zoomed in so it doesn't all fit. Um, but I'm basically going to insert a table, which you can also do with at table. Yep, that's a thing, at table. Um, this one is a six by six table. So I'm gonna just make a six by six table. Cool, so far so good. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Let's do like that, okay. And then I'm gonna go back and see, okay. So I've got, looks like I've got six rows, great. And this, this first one is all of them across. So I'm gonna select all the cells across the top all the way over. Yep. And then if I right click, um, if you don't have a mouse, like if you're on like a trackpad or a laptop, you're like, there is no right click. Um, if you do two fingers, a two finger tap, that's a right click. Or if you hold down, um, if you have a Mac, you hold down command and click. If you have a PC, hold down control and click. But I'm gonna do the two fingers. So two fingers, right click. Oh, I was too, I was too aggressive. <laughs> right click. Um, and then I'm scrolled down and there's my merge cells. There we go. Nice one, nice big cell. Okay, now what's next? If I go back over here, okay, it looks like these two are the same width as three. They're each the same width as three. Okay, so back to my document. So one, two, three. I'm gonna right click, merge cells. Okay, the next one I know is also three. So I selected them, right click, merge cells. Now, what if you're like, oh wait, shoot, I only wanted to merge two of them. You over, if you over merged, um, if you right click in that cell, you'll see there's an unmerge option that puts it back. Okay, so you can you can un, you can also undo is another option. But I'm gonna merge cells. Let's see what else is over here. Okay, I've got these two are merged, and then these ones. Okay, so I'm gonna go. So I know that these two get merged. So right click, merge cells, and then these two. Right click, merge cells. These two, right click, merge cells. Okay, so now it's taken shape. What else did I have to do? I'm gonna go back. Okay, so those are each four separate. These are two long ones that go to the bottom. Okay, those are easy. So I'm gonna go over here and these are my two long ones and they go to the bottom. Merge cells, merge cells, great. And let's go back and see. And then I've got another tallish one and then too long and skinny. Okay, so let's make my tall one first. So there's my tall one, merge cells. And then now I know these two merge cells and merge cells. And now we've got the basic shape. Um, on the hints page, I gave you the colors that I used. So here are the hex codes for the colors I used. You're welcome to also use yourself. Um, and the other thing that I did, I'm going to go to my, not that one, close some tabs here, close, close close, not there, there. The other thing that I did is these borders here are white and they're thick. So if I select the whole table, um, all of it, all of it, um, this little box here, this little down arrow, if I click on it, I can pick all of the lines. And then now I can say that I want them, I've got them as white and then I made them really thick. 
Uh, you can make them any color you wanted though. So I could make them, you know, like black and really thick. Um, any color works. I just made it white and really thick. If I didn't want those lines there at all, remember to make it invisible, I do zero. And now there's now there's no lines in between. So that's that's how I that's how I made that. Okay. Um the that was meant to be a challenge. So if you were like, that was really hard. I, I, it is, it is supposed to be a challenge. It wasn't supposed to be super, super easy. Um, and I would say it was just meant to help and like practice merging practice, um, you know, maybe working on borders, you know, kind of whatever part you got to was the part that was good for you to work on. You can totally come back and work on this again, another time. Um, that's part of that, that norm is take what you can today and come back for more, um, for more later. Oh, good. Olivia, you asked really quick. This is great. Before I move on, she asked, can you show how to put in the colors? And yes, yes, I can. So I got to close some tabs. We have too many tabs. I can close that one. I don't need that anymore. Okay. So over here, back to my, my empty one. Um, if I want this, this top box to be that, to be like a teal color, um, I can select it or I can just click inside of it. And I'm looking for the paint can. There's my paint can. And I can say, make it green, right? Whatever colors I want. Click inside, paint can, make it purple. I can select multiples. So I can say like maybe all of these, I want to be orange. Great. Maybe I want both of these to be I'm running out of colors, blue. Okay. Um, so that's that's how you make it is with that with that paint can. And if you can't see the paint can, it's under the three dots. Remember Will that mine show, is really zoomed in. Jessica, maybe show them how to use the paint can plus the hex codes. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good point. Um, so so this was one of the colors was um 41AFAA. That's one of the colors. And so here, if I want to make this top one that color, when I click on the paint can, there's a little plus button to add a custom color. So I'm gonna click that plus button custom color. And here's my here's my hex code. So I'm gonna type in 41AFAA. Great. And there's that tealy color. Nice and pretty. Um, when I go to another one, it saves that color. So I can use that color again. I don't have to enter it again. It, it like knows it's in my palette of stuff here. Um, but it, uh, you'll have to add each color individually. So if I want to go, I'm going to go back over and I'm going to, I want to add the 466EB4, that kind of like periwinkle purpley color. So I'm going to do these two and I want to do the paint can plus sign um, for, four, six, six, EB four. And there's that kind of like moody periwinkle. I might've copied that. I might've written that down wrong. Maybe it's an A. Um, the, the, the eyedropper tool, Anthony. Yes. You can also do the eyedropper tool. Good noticing. I love it. Um, the little down arrow, there's this eyedropper. So I can go and I can say like, oh, what was this orange color here? I want that one. And it will make it that color. So it's a, it's slick. We've got some questions about borders. Um, so to select the whole table, it's a it's a little tricky when you've got merged spaces. I tend to just kind of push, I hold down shift and I push like arrows until I've got all of the boxes are filled in. Um, and so if I'm gonna do borders, I need to select the borders first. So I've got my whole table selected. I pick, um, oh, and that's, it's hard to see, get rid of that. Um, I pick this cause I wanna edit all the borders and I can change the colors. So I can make them, you know, gray, super thick. This here is how I did like dashed lines or the dotted line is there. That's where that is. The bigger it is, the bigger the dots are. So like if I go down to one, the dots are really small, right? Maybe three is kind of in the middle. You can see medium-sized dots. Um, so that's how you do dots. And so the newsletter um, was just like a one by one table. It was just like a one cell table. And then I put dots around the whole thing. All right. We are going to move into... Um, is Google Sheets. Google Sheets is next. So I'm going to close this um, and I'm going to close this and we are headed to Google Sheets. Um, same thing with Google Sheets. We're going to talk about some strengths. I've got some strategies and tips and then I have a challenge for you. And I'm going to preface the challenge and say that it's using a lot of the same skills like merging, fill it, like using the paint can to fill in the color, but we're going to do it in Google Sheets instead. So it's a lot of the same skills. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. Strengths of Sheets. Um, sheets are, like I said, are just a really big table. I think that they're really intimidating because, you know, you could do formulas, you could do like data, you could put charts in there. Right. And so it can feel like, oh, I, I don't, I don't want to touch sheets. No, thank you. 
but sheets is just a really big table. And if you're making tables and docs and doing stuff with pictures and words and text and stuff inside of tables and docs, you can do it in sheets as well. Um, what I really like about sheets is that it's not limited to existing printing dimensions. So like for the most part with Google docs, you have to like pick like legal or letter or like page list, but with, um, with uh, sheets, I can make like something like really tall and skinny, or I can make something like really long and, um, and, and short. You're not limited to any um, printing dimensions. It also has tabs along the bottom for navigation. So um, whereas like Google Docs, you have to like scroll down to a different page. Same thing Google Slides, you have to go to a different slide. Sheets, when you look at it, you can see the different pieces that are there. I like that a lot. Um, and then in Sheets, you can also link to specific cells. So I can, you know, have like a, like my first tab can be like a table of contents and those things each link to different tabs in that same spreadsheet in certain cells with different pieces there. Um, I put my newsletter here in Google Sheets. I'm going to scroll back out again. Well, let's do this. So this is that same newsletter. I just put it into Google Sheets. Um, and so you can see like this is the March newsletter. And then I could, you know, put in the April newsletter. You can see I, I just I started. I didn't really finish it. Um, but you can add a tab for each month. So that's that's um, like a way that, again, you know, when you're looking at this, I can tell that the, the page for April is here. And I can go easily to um, to April's to get, uh, like I can see what, which things are here versus like not knowing that I had to scroll down. Um, you can also use formulas in Sheets to make things more responsive or interactive. My best example of this is my scavenger hunt. Um, and these are all in the, in the deck. You can absolutely look at these in the deck, but basically in the scavenger hunt, as you check things off, you'll see it's counting. So now it's got one because I checked one. If I check another one, now it says two. And each time the inspirational, motivational message changes. So then I click another one and it says, wow, looks like you're getting the hang of it. Cool. Wow. You finished a third of them already, you know, as, as you're checking things off high five for you got five done. Um, and so that's just using a formula. It's counting how many checkboxes there are. And then there's a hidden bit of cells down here. That's tell it what to do that when it's, when it's five say high five for you. Um, so it's a, it's a mixed, um, it's like mixing two things. It's, this is a count if it's checked and then if this number, if this count is a certain number, you put this message there. So um, it looks like magic, but it's not. That's the scavenger hunt. Um, so you can use formulas to make it more responsive, like counting how many things um, or making it interactive. So like I said, spreadsheet is just a table. It's just, it's just a big table. You can merge cells. You can um, make columns wider or shorter. You can make rows taller or shorter. Um, it's, it's, it's just a giant table. You can also delete extra columns and rows you don't need. So a lot of times I'll figure out what space I want and I will delete the rest. So there's no extra, there's no like infinite scroll down to, you know, row number 999. Um, and then you can also um, insert images right into, you can put them inside of a cell or you can put them on top of stuff. And then um, cells can be dragged around. So I can be like, oh, this cell right here with this text in it, actually I want it over here. And I can just drag it really easily without having to like cut and paste type of thing. Sheets also come with themes where you can set the colors um, and even like the font and um, some of those other things. You can you can do all of that, actually set like a theme for your sheet that's under the format menu. They have some preset options. Um, you can create your own custom one. And um, there is a default text font, um, but they only give you six options. You can't pick any Google font. Um, you only have six options for the default text. When you're actually in the spreadsheet, you can make it any font you want. Um, it's just the default text font. They only give you six options. So some other things to know about sheets, um, the again, those tabs along the bottom are really great because they're always visible. So everybody knows what the possible options are, like what the possible pages are inside of the sheet. That's a pretty great strength, I think, of Google Sheets. It's um, between that and the, the formulas are the reasons why I love it so much. If you're looking for a dropdown in Google Sheets, that's called data validation. Um, you can find it under the data menu and um, it's really great for standardizing like rubrics or other things like that. Um, the data validation is a, basically it limits the, the different things you can have in there. And so it creates a dropdown. So you have to choose from the possible things that it limits it to. You can hide the grid lines in Google Sheets. Um, so by, by um, uh, like here, you can kind of see very faintly, there's like grid lines in between these little grid lines. Um, you can actually hide those. Um, and so that's, um, under the, the view menu, there's a show 
sub menu. And then under that, there's an option to hide grid lines so you don't see them. Um, and that just kind of like smooths everything out. You can also align the text within the cell. So, you know, if you if you drag the row to make it really tall, you've got this big cell and you start typing, it'll start at the bottom. The bottom is the default. Um, but there's this, it's like a line with a, with a down arrow. Um, that button there in the tool, toolbar is how you move the text up to the top or put it in the middle of the cell. And the same thing with wrapping. Um, it'll just, by default, it does at the bottom of the cell, like a single line of text all the way over, and then it will it might, it might cut it off if there's something in the cell next to it. But if you want it to look like a paragraph where it like wraps naturally, um, you just have to choose the wrap option. So um, I think it, the button, the button looks like one of these. I think it looks like whichever one it currently is set to. And so I think this, I'd already change it to wrap. So it might look like this one here, the like line with the arrow pointing across. Um, but this, this curvy arrow is the one where you wrap it around. So I've got some resources again, and we're going to kind of do the same thing. I've got a challenge for you. Um, but I, my big hint for this challenge is that it's a lot of the same skills. We're looking to merge cells. We're going to look for making cells have um, a background color. And then um, the I ask, I, I'm going to ask you to insert an image as well. So these are some resources that can help you out with all those things. Um, I'm going to give you again some time to like try it yourself. And then I will show you how, um, how to do it. But I want you to, there, there's that productor struggle, right? So I want you to see if you can figure it out first because um, they are related skills. It's, it's very similar to docs. So here we go. You're going to create this. <laughs> um, and so some things you can already kind of notice is that there are no grid lines visible. I turned off grid lines. I'm also giving you the colors here. So this darkest purple is this F3E. Um, the, this like medium purple here is the 816. And the light purple background is the 534. This gray color, the shadow down here um, is just six Cs. The monster image I got from here. So I'm gonna help you like find these things a lot faster. And then I also deleted, you can see it goes over to column M, um, N and beyond. I deleted those columns. And then it only goes down to row 20, rows 21 and further, I also deleted. Um, so give that a try and see, um, I, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to, to try on your own. Um, you're just going to open a, a new Google Sheets. So you can go to sheets, oops, sheets.new. That'll make a new Google Sheet. Um, and good luck. See what you can do. I'm going to put this, not this. I'm going to put this. Actually, I can give you this. We'll do this. I'll give you this. Okay. That's what you're making.
Okay, another minute to see how much you can do on your own. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and turn. Um, actually, the 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 next slide after. So I'm on slide 34. Slide 35 has hints. So um, and the hint that I that I've got here is I turned the grid lines back on, so you can see what's really happening underneath here. Um, those Turning those grid lines off like smooths everything out so nicely that you can't tell that there's actually, they're actually separate cells. Like most of the light purple stuff is they're all separate cells. There's um, very little that's actually merged. And the same thing with, um, with some of these, oops, with some of these pieces is that like they're, they're only merged to make a make a margin, um, but from not from not for any other reason. So, um, in here, in my thing under view, I'm going to go show grid lines here. And so, to merge a space, there's actually a button in Google Sheets, which is really nice. There's like a, a button on the toolbar. So, in Google Docs, where we had to like right click with two fingers to to find the merge thing in Google Docs, or sorry, in Google Sheets, it's in the toolbar. So, I'm going to actually look up here, and I'm going to take like these four cells, I'm going to merge them. So I highlighted them, I selected them. Um, mine is inside the dots because my thing is so small, but there's actually a merge button. And so there, now they are merged, okay? And you can select as many cells as you want. I can, you know, merge all of these if I want to merge. And if I'm like, oh shoot, I didn't want to merge all of those. If I click it again, unmerged, they're all back to unmerged. So what I did to start is I, when I made this, um, is that, let me go a little smaller, is that I went and I made the whole thing purple. I started by making the whole thing purple. Um, and I, you can easily select the whole thing. If you click this box in the corner that has nothing in it, that will select everything. So I went and I made the whole thing light purple. And then I started identifying the spaces and cells where I would need it to be white instead. And then I changed those back to white. Um, I also, as I went, I made borders that had the dark colors. Um, so like this one, this cell here, come on a little bit. Uh, this cell here has the darkest purple on the top and on the side. And so in my menu, um, you actually have borders here in the menu. And I can say that I want, you know, I picked a color. And so it was my darkest color and I chose the thickest line. And then I said, I want that to be over on the left side and on the top. Um, you can put it in other places. Like I could put that on the bottom if I wanted to, but it didn't, that wasn't what I wanted it to look like. So I didn't put it there. So I just put it on those two sides. And so the merging kind of helped because instead of selecting every single cell, I could just select the one, choose the borders and say, yeah, I want that dark purple to be on the left. Um, great question, Judy. You like read my mind. Um, Judy and Helen are like on the same page here the way to delete all the extra rows, because there's a lot of them, every Google sheet defaults to like, I think it's like 26 columns and a thousand rows. It's, it's far too many for anything I ever need to do. Um, I'm going to make a new tab here. The quickest way to delete them. If you click on the letter of the column, if I click that, it, it selects the whole column. 
um, I'm going to hold down the shift key. And I'm going to push the right arrow. So I'm holding down shift and I'm pushing the right arrow to select. Yep. So select, select, select. I can hold it down. There we go. All the way through Z. That's all of them. Then up here in this bar, I'm going to use my two fingers. I'm going to right click and I can delete columns C through Z. And now they're gone. They're not there. Same thing with rows. So I can say like, if I click on this 11 here, it selects all of row 11. And then if I hold down shift, I can, you know, push these, push this down or I can hold it down. Um, there is a keyboard shortcut to go all the way to the bottom because you can see this is kind of slow. So um, if I do shift, I'm on, I've got a Mac. I do shift command down arrow. You'll see now all of a sudden it's selected to a thousand, but same idea. Um, I use my two fingers. I right click on one of the numbers and I delete the rows. So that's how it's, that's kind of like the quicker way. Columns are easier to delete than rows are just because rows are so many, um, but that's the, that's the quick and dirty way. So review really quick, quick review for columns. I click the letter and then I'm going to take my, sh my, my finger and hold down the shift key and my other finger, I'm going to push the right arrow. So I'm going to the right selecting. I can hold that right arrow down to get all the way to the end. Great. Now I'm going to take two fingers and right click on top of one of the letters. And I'm going to choose delete columns. C through Z. And there they are. Same thing for rows. I'm going to click on row 11. I can zoom in a little bit here. Um, I'm going to click. I just clicked on row 11. Um, one finger on the shift key, one finger on the down arrow, and I can go down and select the rows I want. The quick shortcut to select them all is on a Mac shift command down arrow. So I'm going to do shift command down arrow, and you'll see it selected all the way down to a thousand. And I'm going to use my two fingers again, right click, delete rows 11 through 1,000. And there you have it, a nice little small tiny table. Um, it is, it is, oh, we have seven minutes left and we have a whole tool left. It's going to be fine. Uh, so that's, um, that's the big, the, the thing with, with sheets is I, yeah, I made my thing smaller and I colored it. And then I started working on making the cells look the way I wanted them to, to insert an image. I merge these two together and I just use the insert menu um, and image and you can insert it in. Uh, you can also paste it in. So I um, actually copied this off of only GFX. Remember only GFX does not have attribution requirements. Um, and so I actually copied it off of that and I just pasted it in here um, and put it inside the cell. Um, the text, this thing I merged all together and I can, you can see I chose um, Peyton, Pey, Peyton one as my font because um, you can choose any font for these spaces here. And so that's that's kind of generally how I made it. I this I made as a shadow, so I offset it by one. And then the other thing that I did, actually, that I haven't mentioned yet, is I changed the width of some of these columns, right? So I've got some wider columns and I've got some skinnier columns. If you click the letter of the column, you can drag it smaller and bigger, right? Um, if I select two columns, so if I want to make I and J the same width, I've got I selected. I'm gonna use that shift, hold down shift, push that arrow to select the other one. And then now whatever changes I make will happen to both of them. So they both get really skinny. Yeah. Um, this is uh, the, again, like docs and sheets are very, are, are, because they both can use tables, they can be very similar. It just kind of depends on like which, uh, it kind of depends on like almost like the situation of like which one makes the most sense. One of the big things of sheets that I like is the tabs that I can, you know, the tabs are always visible. You can always tell how many spaces there are, how many like tabs there are to look at. Um, you can color code tabs. So if I double click on the tab name, I can actually um, change the color and I can make it, you know, like red. So now that tab has a red thing underneath. Um, so like, I like the tabs because there's that visibility, but um, it can be tricky sometimes to type a lot of stuff into Google Sheets because you can see it like puts it all up here and it's, um, it's, it's not always easy to like write a lot of stuff. So it kind of depends on the project. Um, it is, it's 2.40. So we have five minutes left. I am not gonna be able to finish in five minutes. I know myself well enough to know that, that I'm not gonna be able to finish in the next five minutes. Um, if you need to duck out because you wanna go to a micro session, that's great. Please, please do. Um, lots of learning. This is getting recorded. I'm going to keep going, but you can watch the recording and you can like skip to this point to, um, to, to get the part that you you didn't see yet, um, but the uh, please fill out that feedback form before you go if you're going to duck out. So for those of you who are sticking around, um, we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Okay. 
and Allison's putting that feedback form in the chat. So make sure you fill that up before you go, please. Thank you. All right. Where? Oh, here we are. We're back in my thing. Okay. I'm going to close that spreadsheet. Okay. Leaf. Okay. Oops. All right. We are going to hop into Google Slides. Um, Google Slides was everybody's favorite tool. So I always kind of save it for the end because I would like you to like, um, like you like learn all the new things, or all the exciting or fun things um, earlier on. But I do have some tricks for slides. Um, the the slides here, uh, we're going to do the same thing. So I've got some strengths. I've got some examples. I've got strategies and tips. And then I've got a challenge for you. So strengths of slides. Um, slides are basically a canvas. And so it's a lot easier to manipulate things. Um, you know, like with images in Google Docs, you kind of you, you kind of have to you kind of have to like put them inside of a table to give them a space to be in, or you end up like funny things with the text acting funny around them. Slides, you don't have any of those problems. You can just like put this thing over here, put this thing over here, make the text box skinnier, make it wider. It's got a lot of flexibility. Um this so slides is, is really more kind of like I always think of slides as like a like a poster board where you can like move the things all around and they can even like sit on top of each other, which you just can't do in any other tool. That's the only, this is the only tool you can do that in. You can link to specific slides in a deck. So the, um, each slide actually has its own unique URL that if you copy, I don't know if you've ever like opened a deck and it takes you right to a certain slide. That's because the URL is different for every single slide. So um, you can ask students uh, to turn in a URL to a specific slide. If you've got a class-wide deck and you're having kids turn in their link on Google Classroom, they can actually link to their specific slide, which is cool. Slides can be printed. Um, they are up there a little bit, they're a little bit shorter than pages are. I don't know if that makes any sense. So like in a landscape piece of paper, excuse me, a landscape piece of paper, you know, where it's, it's long, um, long on the ends and shorter on the top, a slide is a little bit shorter than a piece of paper. So, but it will fit on a piece of paper. So you can print um, a slide to fill the whole page. There also are more viewing options. So like many of you notice that this deck today, it looks like you're watching a slideshow, your copy of the deck. Uh, that was on purpose because I actually published the deck uh, because we had, at one point we had like 248 people on the deck and a deck will not function with 248 people looking at it. So I actually published it um, so that we could all look at it. The but you can, you can have students look at it as a presentation mode and it can feel more immersive that way. And then layouts are great for um, templates. So in your slide deck, if you, when you, whenever you make a slide deck, you might notice that you have like different layouts. You've got like a title slide and you've got like a one column text slide and you've got like a blank slide, right? You've got different layouts. Um, you can actually use those to your advantage to create layouts that students can use to add their contribution to like a student-wide deck. And I've got an example of that right here. So what I'm trying to explain is that we've got room 309's yearbook and we've, people are going to be able to add in different things into this um, deck. But the cool thing is that, you know, um, if I go to add a new slide, I can pick from, I made all these different layouts of what, which ones you know, they might want to pick for their background, for their color, right? So I've got a yellow one here so that they can use the yellow one. And so what I did is basically I customized the layouts. I took away all of the other ones that were built in and I just left the ones that um, I wanted them to be allowed to use. So I've got like a splattered paint one. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what I was trying to say is that like you can edit the layouts so that the only ones available are the ones you want students to use to complete the task you're asking for. Um, another thing is... Uh, there's a lot of, um, I've done a lot of like one by one activities with students. And so I taught world language. Um, and so what I would do is I would give, this is a formative assessment. I would give all of the students um, the same link to the same deck and they would each get a number. Um, and so this is, you know, student two would be on slide two, et cetera. Student, you know, nine would be on slide nine. And you can see all the slides are the same. Right. Um, and basically this was a unit where we were practicing school supply vocabulary and locations. So I might say like the laptop is on top of the table and they would take the laptop and they'd move it on top of the table. And it was like a way for me to look and see kind of like who was generally getting it, who wasn't. Um, granted, they can all see each other's. So it's not necessarily like a really great assessment, summative assessment per se, but it's like a great way to practice or a great way for them. Like, they're like, oh, I forgot what on top was. I can kind of like look and see all my classmates put it on top. Okay. Um, you know, I can say like the eraser is under the desk, right? The book is next to the phone. Um, these, you know, I could kind of like at a glance see as I, as I scrolled through like, oh, the student didn't put the laptop on top of the table. I, may, I might need to check in with them. Or I might need to review this, um, these words with them. 
So um, that's, I, they're called one by one activities. And basically it's, you've got, it's, it's one deck with one slide for each kid and the slides are all identical. Um, another example is the math one, the graphing one. This is one that's um, really great. You can give, you know, give students um, an equation and they have to graph the lines. They, you know, they drag it over here and they have to put the line, you know, on the, on the coordinate plane, right? Or you can say like, you can say, you know, graph the point. And, and so you, then you can kind of like scroll through and be like, oh, here's a common misconception. They've got the slope is too steep, right? Um, it is, I want to say it is 247. So if you were going to go to a mini, uh, micro session, thank you. Goodbye. It was really nice to see you. Um, you can watch this recording later. I just wanted to let you know that the time had, it is time to go to your micro session if you're going. Um, and so that's what, those are one by one activities. And so again, it's, it's, it's one deck with one slide for each kid and it's an identical slide. So you make one slide and you copy it a bunch of times. It's really, um, really, really easy to set up. Um, and then at the end, because slides have version history, you can actually just revert it back to the version before the kids touched it. So you could reset it for next year or whatever. That's really slick. Um, so those are one by one activities and you can use layouts in that way to create that kind of stuff. So like I was saying, um, some strategies, slide is just a canvas. Um, it's really easy to layer stuff. It's really easy to drag and drop. It's great for cursor-based activities. You want students like sorting things or, you know, dragging and dropping, scribbling. There's like a scribble tool inside the line button. They can like draw a circle around the thing. Um, it's a, it's really great for cursor-based activities for students. And then you can also set custom background images. So um, you can upload any image. And so a lot of times, like if I'm gonna go back to the math one here, this coordinate plane here is the background. They can't move it, they can't delete it. That coordinate plane is set in stone for um, for for what it's worth. And so, but that's because this coordinate plane is the background image. So they can't change, um, they can't change the, the, that background that's just part of the background um but that means you know you can use like a pdf you, you can turn it into an image and that can be um i've seen one of my colleagues um used to teach middle school humanities and he would do he'd have students annotate readings inside of google slides and so we'd put like the the, the reading a picture like of the reading of the text and the students would put like you know circles around stuff they would put like notes and comments and text boxes and arrows and all sorts of stuff um and so it's it's great for that kind of tool because you can lock down the thing that they're essentially um, stacking stuff on top of. The theme builder is how you do all of that. The theme builder is where you set your desk colors. It's where you create and adjust and remove slide layouts. Um, it's where you set your default font and font style. And it's, you, um, it's also where you can create new layouts by using title and text placeholders. You do want to, when you're creating a new layout inside a theme builder, you always want to have a title placeholder, even if it's small and in the top corner. So like here, my title placeholder is strategies for design and slides. And when I click on this 39 in the corner, you can see that all of my slides have names. They're all named. And this one is named strategies for design and slides. That title placeholder, when you put text into it, becomes the name of your slide. Um, so if you've ever seen like where you insert a new slide and it says like, title goes, what does it say? Title goes here, title text here, something like that. Um, whatever you put in there, that becomes the, the title of your slide. And that's, yeah, that's the name of the slide for navigation. There are some other um, tricks that I've kind of mentioned a little bit already. The, um, you can link to specific slides in the deck. The, remember that the URL, um, oh, actually, I'm, as I'm rereading this, I'm realizing I'm explaining this I'm thinking of something else. Um, you can link to specific slides in the deck. So like when you go to put a link in a deck, you can actually link to a slide later in the deck. So that's actually how, like here, where this accessibility resources points you back to a slide that's earlier. That's how I did that. Um, so you can actually link to other slides within the same presentation. The URL is um, how you can set the student's viewing experience. So you know how most Google like a slides file end in like slash edit. If you swap out edit for other things, that's how you can have it um, do, do other stuff. So like if I swap out edit for template slash preview, now the slide looks different and it's got a use template button, which will make a copy. So it's um, the URL can adjust to what, what it looks like for students or for, for viewers, it doesn't have to be students, it can be anybody. If you want, um, if you have adults looking at it, you can also adjust their viewing experience. Uh, we talked about locking the background image. That's where you're gonna add it um, as a background image. A lot of times I'll make that in drawings and then I'll upload it as an image. Cause like the, like that um, coordinate plane, for example, was a square and the, the background is a rectangle. So I actually made the rectangle in Google drawings with like the coordinate plane in the middle. Um, and then 
the slides by nature, anywhere you click on them, they auto advance when they're in slideshow mode. Um, and you can prevent that by using a transparent rectangle. It's a, there are certain times where you want students to like stay on the slide and not be able to go to another one um, because of what you've, what you've made in it or whatever. And that would be the, the transparent rectangle. Um, that only happens in slideshow mode. Um, if they're like editing a, a slide, it doesn't advance to the next one, but um, in slideshow mode, they auto advance when you click anywhere. So if you put a transparent rectangle that links back to the slide they're currently on, then um, the, when every time they're clicking, it's just taking them back to the same place. Okay, um, these are my slides resources. And then, um, you know, same thing, feel free to check those out. And then I'm gonna give you a challenge. And this time we're gonna focus on theme builder. So we're, not, we're gonna take a departure from tables and from merging and all that kind of stuff. And we're gonna pay, we're gonna, um, do something in theme builder. So I've created a basic theme here and I want you to um, kind of create your own basic theme. You can absolutely try to make mine exactly the way it is. You're also welcome to like make it different. But what I would like you to do is start a new Google Sheets, or sorry, a new Google Slides file. Slides.new will get you a new Google Slides file. Um, go into the view menu and choose template builder. And in fact, I'm gonna actually demonstrate this. So I'm gonna go slides.new, oops, only one W in new. And there is a, there's a new um, Google slide. I'm going to close this because I don't need this. This little bar, I'm going to close. Up in view, I'm going to go to theme builder with that little artist palette. That's where I want to be. So view theme builder. And then these are all my layouts. And so you've probably seen layouts like this before, right? These all look familiar. We've all seen slides that look like this. Um, I'm actually, I want you to delete all but five. So choose five. So like I'm going to keep title. Uh, I don't need this one. So I'm just going to push the delete button. So it's gone. Great. I'm going to keep this one. Uh, this one I'm going to get rid of. So I'm just going to kind of get rid of them until I've got just five left. Uh, I'll keep that one. Let's see. The blank one I'm going to keep. I kept the numbers one. I kind of like the numbers one. Oh, actually, I see there's a there's a fully blank one. And then there's a, a little text. I'm going to delete that one, actually. So here, now I've got five. One, two, three, four, five. Great. I've got five layouts. Okay. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and adjust things in here and kind of see what happens. Um, so like this top slide here is the overall theme. So if I change my, my title style here, if I go and I make it, um, I'm going to make it freckle face, right? That like that font, you'll see that all the other titles on all the other slides now we're using that same, that same font, right? So it's kind of like I can set the default up here. I can also um, change the color. So I can say, I want it in here, the A, I want it to be purple. Great. Um, and you see now all the titles became purple. So that top one is kind of like the default style. A lot of times I will leave this one as black. So like, I'll leave it as black. I'll set whatever my font is. And then down here, I'm like, oh, well, on the title slide, I actually want it to be, you know, that's where I want it to be purple, right? Um, I will actually go and usually do it on the individual places because it's very rare that I want the title to always be purple. Um, but you could, you know, certainly set it that way. So I want you to go in, remember we went to view, we went to theme builder, and I want you to kind of create a theme, insert some images. I've got an example here, there it is, um, where I've got, you know, my title slide, I put like a watercolor thing in the back. I used images from only GFX um, as a way to, to like pull in some things and because um, they don't require any attribution. And I would um, just kind of play with it for a little bit and see what you can make. And I'm going to give you five minutes to play with it. Yeah, five minutes. Yes, Renee. Um, Renee asked, so if you're working, keep working on that. You can ignore this question, but Renee asked, um, uh, I'm gonna scroll up because I'm gonna look at the actual question you asked, which I remember seeing it. I'm wondering if there's a way to print Google Slides at a different size. I saw you can change the size of the screen, but that messes up all my formatting since my deck has a million things layered on top of each other. I wanna keep the slide deck the same, but just print the pages up slightly smaller. Um, great question. So when you go into print, 
it takes a preview. It, it, I, I like that it tells you it will take a few moments. It's like a good time to like take a deep breath. Oh, just waiting. There we go. Um, you can change the, I'm trying make, to make sure I understand what you're asking. Um, you can change like the type of paper. You know, if I'm printing to a piece of paper, I can change it to like legal, for example. Um, and legal fit slides a little bit better. That's actually the proportions that slides uses is legal sized. Um, so that's, you can change that and you can see it keeps everything the same. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything there. The, if you want to save as a PDF, uh, which is here, save as a PDF, um, then you are, oh, you want the image smaller, like the margin around it. Okay. Good clarification. Um, in, if you do, I want to say it's, if you do print using system dialogue, then it, and I know now you can't see this little window that popped up, but it's, it asks me for like scaling. And so I can like make it, you know, a smaller scale. Um, but that print using system dialogue should. We, we are the, seeing those pop-ups. Oh, you were seeing the pop-up with the. Yes. Okay, great. I'll put it back then. Since it was like a different kind of window, I was like, oh, they probably can't even see it. That's like a nice change, right? That you're usually you're used to things not showing up and you're like, oh, wow, a thing showed up. That's great. So um, yeah, print using system dialogue. And then I've got scaling here that I can change. And I can say, you know, like make it 90. Um, and that should add some space around. Um, is there a preview here? I don't see a preview here. You can, um, a lot of times what I do is I'll save it as a PDF first, and then I will go and I will, when I print the PDF to the printer, I will have it scaled on the PDF, if that makes sense. Um, that I usually do it in two, in two steps. Um, I, I mean, Google, Google's idea is they probably don't really want you to print anything, right? They want you to use their product um, and it's a digital product. And so I imagine that's why they don't have a better printing option for slides. I also suspect that in the business realm, like nobody prints slides. It's probably just us education people who print slides. So I suspect that that's also why it's not a very good workflow. But a lot of times I will, um, I will do a, a PDF. So when I go file and, um, and I print, kind of takes me once again, generate that preview. When I save it as a PDF, then when I go and print, so it's it's basically it's saving saving them as pages, but I can tell it when I print to like scale the pages down, um, and I find that to be a lot easier because I can see what I'm doing. So, um, you know, I can we can make this work. So I'm gonna I'm gonna save this as a um, class yearbook. Okay, and then I'm going to change the way I'm sharing. I was like testing my facilitation skills. Okay. New share, give me this one. Okay. Okay, so here I am in my, this is my PDF. It's got all of my slides in here, right? So now when I go um, to print, it shows me this preview here that Google Slides was not showing me. Um, and so I can say, you know, this actually also gives me like fill the entire paper versus print the entire image. Um, or I can say, you know, make it make it 70%, right? And now they're they're small. I can also change the orientation. So like they, there's lots of settings in here, but it's giving me this preview. So that's usually why I'll do it this way. Cause as you could see, we did it in Google Slides. We couldn't see if we made it 70%, how big it was. It was, it's like a lot of, you'd have to like print it out a bunch of times to figure it out. Um, so like, yeah, you can, that's, that's what I would do is I would do it through, save it as a PDF, open it as a, as a PDF, and then go through the print thing to change the scale, um, and do it that way. It's my recommendation. Okay. Um, it has been five and a half minutes since I sent you to, to work on that. So I go back to this one. That's the one I want. Okay. Sure. Now I definitely have too many windows open. If I had too many windows open before, we definitely have too many windows open now. So this is the one that I made. Um, again, we went to view and we went to theme builder and I picked kind of like a funny, funky um, 
title title style here. Remember that you you get two fonts right when you're designing, and so the title style because it's bigger can be a little funky. Um, you know, this this font is fine when it's big. It'd be really hard to read when it was small. Um, so it's it's fair to to kind of play with that and see. But then that font that does all the text, you want it to be very um, very very readable. And remember, sans serif fonts are easier to read than serif fonts. Um, and then I just kind of played around. I like added the image here and rotated it and I scooted these things over. I just kind of played around with putting different images and different different things around. Um, here I made the text white instead of black. So I was just kind of playing with it. This one, I repeated the same little arrows image over and over and over again on the top and bottom to create a border. Um, so just kind of playing with it. And so then when you're when you're done playing with it, when you close out of it, I've just got these five things I can choose from. So I can add new slides, but only from these choices and all these things now this this image that I inserted is locked down I can't I can't move it I can't touch it I can't erase it or anything okay so um it is a little bit uh micro session number one goes until 320 micro session two starts at 320 and goes till 350 um that is all of my stuff but I'm happy I don't have anywhere to be so um since you all are still here if you have questions or things you'd like demonstrated uh, I'm happy to to demonstrate them if you want to put them into the chat. Uh, if you are, if you're like that, my brain is full. I want nothing more. Please, thank you so much for coming. Um, make sure you fill out the feedback form. Allison's going to put it in the chat right now again. Uh, but make sure that you fill out that feedback form. I'd love to hear what you think. I I kind of redesigned this from last year, so I'd love to hear what you think about it. Um, and have a really great start to the school year. So thank you so much for coming. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If you have things you want me to demonstrate, put them in the chat. Make sure you fill out that feedback form and have a great year. I feel like this picture is like a really good, really good picture of what just happened to all of you, right? Because <laughs> you came, Did, but you're like, Helen has some things. <laughs> Helen has a question there too. Okay. How you're do like, you I want to learn some things, and then I proceeded to spray you in the face with water. Um, yeah, Helen, how do you name slides? Okay, let's do it. So to, to 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 make slides have a name, all you have to do is put in a title. So for example, here I've got this deck, right? And I'm going to give it here's title example, right? And then I'm going to insert another slide here, um, this one. But this time I'm going to delete this title thing here. But I'm going to type it here. So I'm going to say title example two, right? Okay, so I've got title example two on this slide, but it's not in the title placeholder. Over here, title example is in the placeholder. So then when I go to um, to do this as like a as like a presentation, now when I click on it, you'll see that slide two has what what's up here in this title box shows up automatically as the name of the slide. But slide three, where I didn't put it in the title thing, that title example two, it just doesn't have a name. And so if you've got all these slides and none of them have names, you know, that, that it can be really hard to navigate. With the deck that I showed you, all of my slides have names. And so you can go back and you can find, you're like, oh, I want to find the information about getting paid. That's on slide five. Oh, I want to find how images and icons work. The, using those title boxes is so easy to do, but it it makes such a big difference for, um, for everybody else, you know, want more continue your learning. That's where you can find all that stuff. So that's what, that's what, how you give them names is that you use the title boxes. And so what that means then is when you are creating layouts, when I'm in that theme builder and I'm creating layouts, um, if I'm going to have a title on here, I want to use a title placeholder. So this little down arrow next to the text box, I can put in a title placeholder. And that's going to uh, make sure that whatever I put in that box when I'm editing the slide will show up. So when I exit out of this, now down here, I've got a place to put a title. Okay. Any other questions I can answer? Um, the green images, I just pasted them in when I was in the theme builder. So like, this is just like a big image that I just, pasted it and I think I cropped it to make it fit this one I it was I think it was it was this direction instead and so I rotated it and I stuck it on the side because I thought that would look nice nice you know balance out like all of the text with the image kind of you know 
make it so that the text isn't so heavy. The images came from only GFX. I'm going to go back up here. Um, only GFX is one of the resources for images that doesn't require attribution. So I don't have to like cite where I got it from, which is cool. Um, and so only GFX, actually, if I click on only GFX, you'll see um, they're free high quality design resources. They've got them grouped in some different ways. I'm, I love the brush and the watercolor. That's what I, I use those a lot for things um, because they're just like swoops of color I can put in places. Um, they got rainbow circles here, um, golden brush strokes. And then they have, I always think these are funny. They have like these like weird special offer 10% off. That could be really good for a math lesson though. I'm just gonna put that out there. That could be like, if you got a math lesson, maybe that'll work really well. Um, but it's just got lots of pages. Here's the Ukraine flag. Here's like almost like gold leaf type, a bunch of different arrows, these things. And you can kind of just like wander through. You can also search. So if I'm, if I know I'm gonna use like orange as my, as the color that I'm designing with, I'll type in orange. And here it's got some orange stuff. Here's orange things. You can find, can find stuff. Yeah, so I just kind of can scroll through and, and go to, there's multiple pages of it so I can kind of see, here's orange camouflage. They just got lots of really great stuff and you don't have to put any like, you don't have to say like it came from a certain place, which is cool. So um, the way I copied the image then, like if I wanted one of these brush strokes, I clicked on it, so it opened up and now I can see each of these individually. And so I can say like, okay, copy image and I'll go back in here, oops, over in here and I'll paste it. And then I can make it bigger or smaller. I can stretch it way out. You know, I can do all sorts of stuff with it. It looks kind of like a little caterpillar there. Um, and so, yeah, I just, all I did was I found the set that I wanted. I clicked on that set. It took me to a new page and they're all here individually. To, you can copy and paste. You can also download it as an image file if you wanted. But all of those, all of those that were up here, they're all individual files down here. Um, to copy the image, uh, if you double click with you know, so sorry, no, if you if you right click if with you get two fingers, you use two fingers on the image, my two fingers, it brings up a little thing and one of the options is copy image. I don't know if you can see that copy image pop up that's there right now. It's a little, but that's what I do. Um it's yeah, it's it's two fingers to click on the image and I'll choose copy image. Um, I see someone asked about the theme builder. Yeah, the theme builder is what makes it uneditable. So for example, this little orange guy I've added in here, if I put him here. Um, and I close, now that little guy is here and you can't move him and you can't do anything with him. Um, he's there. Same thing with text. So if I'm in theme builder and I give it a title now, I say like instructions, um, or sorry, if I put in a text box and I say um, instructions here or whatever, you know, I'm gonna make it a little bigger so we can see it. Okay, instructions here, right? I, I put this text on there. When I close this out, this, this instructions here, I can't edit it, I can't erase it, I can't move it, I can't copy and paste it. It's like stuck on the back. So um, what's nice is if you are giving students uh, a thing that they're editing or a thing that they're working on and you make them a template, you can stick stuff on the background so they can't accidentally delete the coordinate planes. They can't accidentally delete the example so that they can't, um, you know, change those things. And it was just as simple as putting it inside theme builder in a layout. So inside theme builder under the view menu. Okay. okay. I see some questions. I see a question about Google docs. Um, I don't mind going back to docs if that's okay. Anybody else have any slides questions before I go back to docs? Okay, show how to copy the only GFX image. Um, so when I find the image I like, so I'm gonna go find a different one. I'm gonna search for leaf. I'm gonna see if there's any leaves in here. Okay, so here's some leaves, cool. Um, let's say that, oh, this maple leaf, that's the one I want. I want the maple leaf. I'm going to click on the maple leaf. And then now I can copy this maple leaf. Actually, the maple leaf is probably a bad example as I said that. Um, this alphabet, maybe I want a green leaf alphabet here. If I click on this, it takes me to a page where I can get to all the letters um, individually. And so I can copy this Q, for example, copy image. 
um, and then I can paste it, you know, over here. There's that cue, right? Um, to copy an image from a website, you use two fingers and you, you click once with two fingers on the on the on the image and it'll bring up a little window and one of the options in there is to copy the image and you can just paste it wherever you want and again only gfx does not require attribution so you don't have to like say this came from only gfx which is cool uh, embedding voice into slides is another thing you can do that's under the insert menu and um, it's under audio you do have to have the audio pre-recorded you can't record it inside of um, Google Slides, you have to have it recorded elsewhere and then put it in, um, or it has to be like music that you take and put in. So that's the the one tricky part about this. Honestly, if you want like a voiceover for your slides, what I do is I actually use Adobe Express. I download my deck as images, and then I use Adobe Express to um, to put all the all the slides as the background image in Adobe Express and. You can like, there's like a microphone button you can hold down and talk. That's actually how, um, if I make, if I make slides with like a voiceover in that way, or the, um, then I, I do it through Adobe Express. But um, if you have like a recording of your voice or a recording of the thing already saved as a file, you can insert it from here. I don't even know if I can find any audio files in here. I don't have any myself. Yeah, I don't think I have any audio files. So, um, but that's how you would do that. Uh, making the background of an image transparent, you you have to use Adobe Express for that as well. So like this, for example, this queue, you can see there's this white box around it, right? Like that's, you can tell with the orange, there's just like white box around it. To get rid of that, you have to use Adobe Express. Um, but everybody in SFUSD has an Adobe Express account. So if I go to express.adobe.com, there's actually also an Adobe Express session that happened earlier today that you can certainly watch the recording of if you didn't get to it. Um, but it's under quick action. I can remove the background. You will need the file. Um, so you have to download the file at that point. So like this queue, I would, instead of copying it, I'd have to save the image. So when I click with my two, once with my two fingers, there's an option to save image as, and I can save it as the queue letter, save. Okay. And then now when I go to Adobe, um, I can put that queue letter in and it'll remove the background for me. So you can't do it inside of slides. You have to go somewhere else. But you can see now this checkered part means that the background is gone. And I can download it and then I can put it back in. Okay, other slides questions before we go back to docs? I wish it told me when someone was typing so I could know if we're all just sitting here waiting <laughs> or if someone's typing. Um, oh, Google Images. So this is a great question. So when you go to um, Google Images, so if I um, so I go to google.com and I search for cats, I like cats. Everybody likes cats, right? I'm gonna go to images. The images you see here are not all free and allowed to use. Um, so like this picture here belongs to Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, it does not belong to, it's, it's not necessarily free to use. There is a tool built into Google search that helps sometimes. So like under tools, um, there's a usage rights option. So I can say creative commons license and it, you can see it, it narrowed down, it took out a lot of the other options that were already there, um, but it's really, you just have to kind of be really careful and when in doubt, give credit. So um, if you remember that PB&J example I gave, um, I just gave credit for where I got it from. If, you, if you're not sure, give credit. The And credit doesn't have to be like right under the image. It can be like in small text at the very bottom of the document or at the very bottom of the slide. Um, so Google Images is free, meaning I don't have to pay anything. You know, I can take this this picture of this adorable kitten, I can take this picture and put it somewhere. Um, but I am going to want to, you know, cite that the picture came from raw pixel in this case. Um, with Unsplash, Unsplash is really great. If you've never used Unsplash, I recommend. So I'm going to search cat in Unsplash. And I've got all these pictures. So like, oh, that's a good one. That's a great cat. Look at that cat. Um, this, this picture, this cat, I can use it. Um, I just have to give, um, the author credit. And so when I go to, how do I do it? I think it's the share. Maybe, how do I? 
Oh, this might be a premium one. Uh, oh, it says Unsplash Plus. I should have read more closely. My bad. I was so excited about the grumpy cat. Um, here's a cat with a butterfly. That's cute. There we go. I was like, this was easier. I thought download for free. And so when I go download for free, it tells me right here, this is what I need to put in there. So I don't know if you can see that. It tells me right here that photo by this, I can copy it and I can paste it. And that's, it's, I can use this beautiful picture of this cat with this butterfly that Karina took. That's incredible. And I just need to put that somewhere that references um that, that that's this picture is not mine that it belongs to karina and that she made it um but then i can have this like look at that look at that cat that's like a work of art i would hang that up in my home uh so yeah unsplash is a really great um resource to find great pictures um that are that are free and that they make it easy for you to attribute with with adobe with sorry with google images you have to kind of like figure out whose picture it is to know who to give credit to so i i do i do i will sing unsplash's praises forever you just have to watch out for those on Splash Plus. They're smart. They put that one you have to pay for at the very beginning. They're like, this is the one we'll trap you with. Um, yeah, ignore the Unsplash Plus because they have lots. You can see there's lots of cat pictures. Um, and even like I'll search, you know, like you can search things like learning. Um, and there's all sorts of, you know, pictures in here of, of people doing learning that looks like, like lots of different kinds of learning. Um, you can type in words like fast. Right. And it's, and it's got thing, you know, so you can, any words you can think of, you can type in here and find stuff that, that makes sense for it. Um, and it's just a matter of when you download it, it tells you how to attribute it. So, okay. Um, yes. The next micro session is about to begin in two minutes. So if you would like to go to micro session two, please head out. It was nice to see you. We are still recording. Anything that happens after this, you can come back and watch and you'll have to watch like a tiny little bit at the end. There's just like a little bit, you can skip most of it. It's, it's, a, we streamlined. So yes, if you are um, headed to the next, to the micro session two, um, I think there's synergy office hours right now. There's a lot, there's a lot of great ones. So if you are headed out, thank you for coming. It was great to see you. You can watch this recording. Um, for those of you who are still here, I'm still here to answer questions. Um, the copy image button. So let me see if I can Okay. Anyway. Um, there isn't a, I'm trying to find the, a picture of the little window that pops up because I'm sure it doesn't show you. Um, it kind of looks like this. So when you click on a picture uh, and you like click with two fingers on the picture, this little thing pops up. It looks kind of like this. And one of the things will say copy image. Um, that's the, that's a, that's, that's the button, I guess. Um, but yeah, you have to, you, you, you click with two fingers on the picture and that's how you can find copy image, but the screenshot also works. You can certainly take a screenshot and insert it that way. That's another option. Um, if, um, somebody asked for something in Google docs. Yes. So click with two fingers. So if you take your two fingers and you put your two fingers on the trackpad, that's how you click with two fingers. If you don't have a trackpad, um, then it's just the right side of the mouse. I have, I have a mouse here. Um, I know it doesn't reach very far. The cord is too short. Um, so on my, on my mouse, sorry, it's over in the, the small side. Um, it'd be the right side button, which is this side, this side's the right side button. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at it, it's the, the one that's on the right side, um, that's right click. Or like I said, if you don't have a mouse, you have a trackpad, um, on the trackpad is you take two fingers and you click with two fingers. Um, oh, Apple mouse. Great question. Let's Google it. Let's Google it. How do you right click on a Mac mouse? That's what we needed right there. Um, oh, and we're in images here. It says press and hold the control key when you click an item. That's what it says, right click on Mac, control click. So hold control key and then click. That's what it says to do. I've never used an Apple mouse. They look very pretty though. They look like a work of art, you know, like a, like a, like a sculpture in like a modern um, art museum. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go back to Google Docs. I'm gonna go back to Google Docs. Um, somebody asked, 
bit ago, and you've been very patient. Thank you for being patient. How do you make the six by six table fill the page? Great question. So I'm going to docs.new. I'm gonna make a new document. Uh, I'm gonna zoom out so we can see the whole page. And I'm gonna go ahead and make it landscape. So I'm in file, page setup, and I'm gonna switch it to landscape. So now it's long, it's, it's wide and short instead of being long and skinny. Um, so there it is. That's the that's the whole thing. And then I'm if you do at table, remember you can insert a table. And I want six by six. And you'll see it kind of just fills up that space there. To make it fill the whole page, I before I do any merging at all, before I before I do any merging at all, I take the bottom one. So I've clicked once, I'm holding down and I'm dragging the bottom one down. And that made a very, very tall bottom row. Have no fear. There's a trick here. Now I'm going to select all the rows, the, the five normal size ones and the one really big one, I'm going to do a right click. So I've got my, my, my two fingers right click and there's an option I sort down to distribute rows. Distribute means make everything even is what that means. So when I click distribute, now I've got all of these are the same height. They're all the same height. I can do the same thing with columns. So if I want like this, make this, you know, if I make these two skinny and this one's wide, um, if I highlight my columns here, I'm gonna use my two fingers, right click, and I can say distribute columns, and you see it made them all even. So it's wherever you put this end line, that's where you'll end up with the distribution. It, it, it takes the top and the bottom one, or like the left and the right one, and it makes everything even in between. Um, so it won't, you know, if, if, if you've got it, um, you know, if your bottom line is up here in the middle of the page, it's only gonna separate out it's just gonna divide this space up. It's not gonna go and fill the whole page. So you just wanna make sure that you put the bottom line wherever you want it to be to end. And then yeah, select, right click, oops, select, right click, and you want distribute. In this case, we're doing rows and now they're all even. And that's how you do it. Okay. All right, is anybody tired of learning new things yet? Yes, Jamie. Yes. Um, I just made the cells gray. Is that ever? That's somewhere in here. It's not that one. <laughs> it's a different one. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie, for answering that question. I appreciate your help. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Any, anything you want to talk about with Google Docs or slides or sheets? If you did not catch my session earlier today about Google Docs and smart chips, I cannot recommend that um, enough. It's, it's, it's really comprehensive. There's lots of stuff like the at table I showed you in Google Docs. There are so many things you can insert into Google Docs. Um, so like I can, I'm going to go in a little closer though. We're going to go into a hundred percent. If I do at um, email draft, this is my favorite one, um, at email draft, then it puts this, this space in here where I can do like, um, I can put Allison in here and I can give a subject, um, recap for yesterday's meeting, right? And I can put, you know, here's my email text in here. And then when I click the M, it'll actually, pop me over to Gmail so I can send the message and it fills everything in for me. It's pretty great. So that's that's a smart, it's a smart chip. So if you, this at symbol, all of these things are smart chips. So if that session, I had a session on all of that earlier today, um, we recorded it. I highly recommend checking it out. It's a good one. Um, lots of people walked away with really incredible stuff. Um, Jamie says, I think I missed the part where you made the cells and the sheets flush when the columns and rows don't line up. The cells and sheets. Um, columns and rows don't line up. Jamie, can you explain what you mean? Okay, great. Um, Peter says, is there anything you can say briefly about using the Google Suite with Windows 11? Um, Google Suite runs through your internet browser. So the, um, you can actually use it on 
any device, whether it's Mac, whether it's Windows, you can use it on any device. Um, it's a, it's a, like an operating system agnostic thing. So like, this is Chrome that I'm using Google stuff inside of. Um, Chrome is the district's recommended internet browser. We've, we, uh, it has the best security and privacy um, settings and it works the best with Google tools, but you can use Google tools inside of Internet Explorer, inside of Microsoft Edge. I don't think Explorer exists anymore. I think I just dated myself. Um, Netscape Navigator, no, also doesn't exist. Uh, Microsoft Edge, uh, Firefox, um, there's uh, there's other there's other browsers and Google because it's a website works inside of all of those. Um, your Google Drive is accessible on any device that has internet access. The Google is is really great. One of the reasons why we went to Google instead of to Microsoft Things is because it works across all devices. Whereas Microsoft, you have to have the software at least originally. Now they have like Microsoft 365, but it used to be that you had to have the software. Um, and it had to be downloaded and the file had to like, you had to like email the file to yourself to be able to put it anywhere else. Um, and so that's why the district initially went Google is because it offered so much more flexibility to move and work across multiple devices, multiple device types. Um, so the using Google suite on windows, um, the only real difference than using it on Mac is that when Mac users use the command button to do something, um, windows users use the control button. So like for Macs, we do Command C for copy. For Windows, it's Control C for copy. That's really the only the only change um, is that switch between Command and Control when it comes to using Google tools. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't believe there's there's still thirty seven of you here. That's that's awesome. You've stuck with me for so long. We've been together like for half a day now. We're basically. We're basically, I feel like we're basically like family members now. We've been together for so long. Uh, is there anything else I can answer for anyone? If not, I'm going to kick you out um, and send you off to find something else to do. We have the, I'm going to put this back up actually. Um, the micro session two is still in process, but like one of them is office hours. You can pop in any time. Um, so you can feel free to go join a micro session there. There's still a good 20 minutes left of micro sessions. And then we do have a closing from 3.50 to four o'clock, which is a really nice, just kind of like send off into the school year, like get ready one week. Kids are going to be here. Families are going to be here. Uh, everybody's going to be rocking and rolling. So the closing is really nice. I always like, I feel like it's like puts like the cherry on top of the whole thing. So um, make sure you come by for the closing. Um, the slide deck, Allison, can you grab that link for the slide deck? Allison's going to put it in the chat. Um, thank you so much for coming. I had a really great time with all of you. Uh, thank you for being um, patient and flexible as we had to adjust some times. Thanks for letting me go over. I always just have too much information to share. That's my that's my, that's my real, my real weakness is I, I have such a hard time like cutting anything out. I'm like, but it's all so good. So um, thank you so much for coming and have a really great school year. Um, best of luck with everything you do. It's going to be a great year.